All right, we're ready for Jeremiah chapters 42 to 45 in our survey, and we're quickly coming toward the end of the book. Uh, if you don't remember how many chapters we've got, we've got 52 chapters. And next week carries us through 49, and then we finish up, I think it's the following week, the book of Jeremiah. Well, we're not through with our trimester. So that leaves time for lamentation. Uh, so we're going to look at lamentations following this, and that's where we're headed. But let's look and see where we are now in our outline that we borrow from Wearsby. Uh, this is our outline of the book of Jeremiah. And I keep reminding you of this for a couple of reasons, always reminding us where we are in the greater scheme of the book, but also as we go over that, hopefully that sticks in your mind so that months later and years later you remember Jeremiah's got three major points. There's this national section, personal section, and international section. Well, we're right here in this personal section uh, in 40 to 45, and we're going to finish that tonight. And then next week we start in to the nations section, or as Wiersbe calls it, the international section. Nearly every book has a nation section. Maybe short, this one's a little longer, and we'll talk about the value of that uh, in our study next time. But anyway, we're finishing this personal section. We've talked about things that were before the siege, and now we're after the siege and with the remnant. And so we covered 41 and, uh, 40 and 41 last time. We covered more than that, but we covered, as far as this section is concerned, those two chapters in our last study. Let's back up in chapter 41 just for a moment. If you weren't here, you need to take note of this. Because much of what happens tonight is dependent on our understanding of some things in chapter 41. And that is because of the assassination of Gedaliah um, that we read about in chapter 41. The remnant, there was a remnant that was led by uh, Johanan that is mentioned in chapter 42 in verse 1. We'll get to him in just a moment. As they're leading this remnant... Uh, they want to go to Egypt. So go back to 41 and in verse 17. If you don't have this mark, this would be a good time to mark it because understanding this principle explains a whole lot about what goes on in 42 through 45 to finish this section out. But back at verse 40, uh, verse, uh, chapter 41, verse 17, and they departed, the text says, and they went on their way to Egypt. Now the next verse explains why they wanted to go to Egypt because they're fearful of retaliation. Uh, because Gedaliah has been killed uh, by Ishmael, and they think that if, if perhaps we stay here, that there's going to be some retaliation toward us. So safety is found in going to Egypt. We're away from all the war. We're going to see that tonight. We're away from all the conflict. We're away from the danger of death. And so if we go away and go to Egypt, that's where safety is. And so that's where they're intending on going. And that's, with that in mind, that's the backdrop of things we're going to be talking about tonight. So here's a summary of 42 to 45, and you're looking for this in your handout, if you're one that fills out your handout. And that is we're looking for a summary of each chapter. Chapter 42 deals with Jeremiah inquires of God, and God answers. And God's, uh, the inquiry of God is not just Jeremiah's interested in knowing what God has to say. They've come to him and made a plea, we want you to go to God and find out an answer from God. They really don't, but that's what they say. Chapter 43, they rejected God and did what they want. Just the opposite of what they said they would do in 42, they do in 43. They said, we'll listen to whatever God says, whether we like it or we don't like it, we're going to bow and submit to God. Well, they didn't do that. And so we're seeing, let me just stop and footnote here, we're seeing a great parallel to many situations today in the world, uh, in religion, and even in the church, where quite often we'll say, we want to do what the Lord says. And then when we hear what the Lord says, that's not what we want. So it's very prevalent for us today. Now chapter 44 is Jeremiah's final warning. This perhaps is the last warning that we're going to read from Jeremiah. Now we're not through with the book of Jeremiah, I recognize. But as far as the warning to the, to the remnant of the people, this is pretty much it when we get through with chapter 44. Chapter 45 is a very short chapter, if you've already read ahead and seen that. It's words of comfort to Baruch and uh, it's words of encouragement to him. He is discouraged. And God says three or four things to him. And those, uh, in fact, in, in a, a couple of verses there, uh, the, more verses in that in chapter 45, but only a couple of verses devoted to God's answer to that. So let's come a summary of the chapter. So here's where we are. We notice in chapter 40, in this last section that we're talking about, in the, the period of the, uh, after the siege, Jeremiah set free and he chose to stay in, uh, in Judah. 
the appointed governor is assassinated and the remnant's in trouble. And they're fearful, again, as we mentioned in chapter 41 and in verse 17 of retaliation. And so they, they've got their mindset toward Egypt. So Jeremiah seeks the Lord's advice for them, chapter 42. Let's focus on that and we'll come to those other three things with reference to the other three chapters. So let's talk about chapter 42. And that is, first of all, two things happen here. First of all, we have the people request Jeremiah to pray for them. And then we have the Lord's reply to that. Well, that's not uncommon to see that uh, throughout the prophets or the Old Testament or the New Testament where, where an inquiry is made of God. And then here's God's answer to that. So let's start verses 1 to 3. Here's the request to Jeremiah. Uh, Johanan, uh, that we've already seen, is somewhat of a leader among them. And all the people gathered together from the greatest they come near, and they say to Jeremiah, and here is the request in verses 2 and 3. Pay attention. In this, let's just back up just a little bit and assume we don't know anything in advance of what happens in the rest of the chapter, and I think you'll be impressed with their attitude if we, don't know what, if we haven't read ahead. Let's just assume this is our first, if we're standing off to the side and we hear them ask this of Jeremiah. They said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please let our petition be acceptable to you and pray to the Lord, uh, to the Lord your God, for all the remnants, since we are left but a few, as you can see. In other words, the remnants left because the, the, uh, uh, the siege has taken place. The third siege has taken place. People have been taken off into uh, Babylonian captivity. Verse 3, that the Lord your God may show us the way in which we should walk and the things we should do. You can't ask for a better attitude than that. We want you to go talk to God and let God show us what we should do. What's our word? The way that we should walk and the way that we should do. We want God to show us exactly what we ought to do. We want to know what God says on this question. So that was their question. Sounds good. I'm impressed so far. Well, at verse 4, Jeremiah agrees to that. Jeremiah agrees to that. Look at verse 4. Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard. In other words, I hear you. I got you. Indeed, I will pray to the Lord your God according to your words that it shall be that whatever the Lord answers you, I will declare it to you, and I will keep nothing back from you. I'm impressed with that attitude. Well, Jeremiah says, I'll go to the Lord for you, and I'll pray to the Lord and see what the Lord says, and whatever he says, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm not going to, to, to paint it in your favor. I'm not going to make it sound like what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you exactly what he said, good or bad, whatever it is. <coughs> and that's exactly... What ought to be done? Now let's stop and footnote here. In earlier passages, like in chapter 7 and verse 16, I won't take the time to trace them for you. You can if you want. 7 and 16 and 11 and 14 and in 14, 11. I'll give those again if you're wanting those. I'll give them again in a minute. Let me tell you what they say. God had told him previous to this not to pray for these people anymore. And I take it parallel to 1 John 5. As long as they're dead set... In, in doing wrong, don't pray for them because they're not showing any signs of penitence. And so I would assume then that Jeremiah may have reasoned that the invasion, this final invasion that destroys the city may have shaken them to, into some sense. You would think it would, but it didn't. Now those references again where he was told not to pray are chapter 7 and 16 and chapter 11 and 14 11 and verse 14, and chapter 14 and verse 11. 7, 16, 11, 14, and 14, 11. God has said, don't pray for them. And so why did he do that? I, we're not told. And I'm just assuming, and this makes sense to me, that the thing that's happened between all of that is that this major siege that he had been prophesying, maybe this shook them to the core, and now they've got some sense about them. And so I'll go to the Lord for them. Now, beginning at verse 5, the people make a promise. They're not through. And so let's get their promise. The Lord, uh, they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true uh, and faithful witness between us. That sounds like an oath, doesn't it? God being our witness. It sounds like an oath, doesn't it? We're making a promise. That if we do not do according to everything which the Lord, your God, sends us by you. It seems to be an oath of saying, God being our witness, we're going to do whatever God says. In other words, let God do to, him, to us whatever needs to be done to us. 
God has witnessed that we've made this promise and let us be punished if we don't submit to God and do exactly what God said. I don't know about you, but I am very impressed with that attitude. If we're standing off to the side and we, we don't know any better, I'm impressed with people who say, go to the Lord and find out what the Lord wants. He said, okay, I will, and I'm not going to hold anything back. And they said, well, that's what we want. Don't hold it back. And whatever he says, whatever he says, we're going to do it. God being our witness, we're going to do that. Well, you're going to find out that's all just a farce here in just a moment. Now at verse 6, whether it is pleasing or displeasing, your translation may say good or evil. In other words, whatever the message is, if, if it's what we want to hear or if it's what we don't want to hear, it doesn't matter. We just want to know what the Lord said. We will obey the voice of the Lord our, our God to whom we send you that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. I'm not sure, but that phrase that it may be well with us may be playing off of something that every Jew was familiar with. And that's what they refer to as the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. And the point there was that if you fear God and obey God, it'll be well with you. Over and over again, it may be well with you. It may be well with you. It may be well with you. And so we're going to obey God so that it will be well with us. Again, I am overly impressed with these people. Now, let's stop for a moment. And you have in your handout a question about the shift in the references to God. I'm not sure what to make of this. Humphreys makes uh, an observation uh, that, and he may be right about this, I, I, and he put some thought into this, obviously, that notice the references when they come to God, they make a plea, verse 2, that would you go to the Lord your God? Now this is the people of God, supposedly the remnant telling Jeremiah, we want you to go to the Lord your God. And verse 3, that the Lord your God may show us. They're still talking about your God. Well, Jeremiah says, I will pray to the Lord your God. <laughs> he reminds them, this isn't just my God, this is your God too. And it's interesting to me that later at verse 6, they refer to God not as your God, but as our God. Now, what do you do with that? I'm not sure, but that's just an interesting observation to me. Um, Humphreys doesn't develop it in detail, but he does hint at the fact that, that they may be referring, this is what your God, this is what you've been telling us your God has said, and Jeremiah is trying to emphasize, this isn't just my God, this is your God. I'm talking to your God too. Do with that what you want. That's just an interesting observation. Now, let's begin at verse 7. Here's the Lord's reply. Now, 10 days went by, according to verse 7, it happened that after 10 days that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Why 10 days? Why not immediate answer? I don't know. The text doesn't say. Some have speculated, and there is conjecture here, that it may be that God was giving them time to reconsider their question. Their question was good, but their motive was wrong, as we're going to see at verse 20. And maybe this was giving them some time to rethink so that when the answer comes, maybe they think this through, considering what all has happened to Jerusalem, how the city has fallen, the temple has been burned, maybe now they'll accept the message. I don't know. Maybe that was what God had in mind. Be that as it may, let's start at verse 7. After 10 days, here the word came, and he calls Johanan and the captains and all the people together, even to the greatest of them, and he said, this is what the Lord has to say to you. What does the Lord have to say? Two things here, point one and two under B. The first one is, if you abide in the land, you're going to be blessed and delivered from Babylon. So let's see what he says. Look at verse 10. That if you will still abide in the land, then I will build you up and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. And I will relent concerning the disaster that I brought on you. I don't think God is saying that I'm, 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 I'm going to be sorry that I brought destruction on Jerusalem. But God is planning on bringing destruction on this remnant. And I'll, come, I'll, I'll dial that back if you make a change in your mind. But they're not willing to do that, uh, as we're going to see. Uh, notice the verse 11. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. So they're afraid of staying in Babylon, because, I mean, staying in, uh, in, in the land, because when the king of Babylon comes in, uh, Gedaliah, his man, was killed, and he's going to take vengeance on us. And we're fearful of him, what he's going to do to us. And he said, don't be fearful of, of, uh, of the king of Babylon. Look at verse, end of verse 11, for I'm, I, uh, I am with you to save you and deliver you from his hand. If they had confidence in God, God said, I'm going to deliver you from him. And he will show you mercy. And uh, 
he will cause you to return to your own land. So when the king of Babylon comes in, he will, he'll show you mercy. If you listen to me, I'll have him to show you mercy. And um, you're, you're, you're going to be safe. You're going to be fine. There's nothing to fear if you just stay in the land. However, however, if you want to go to Egypt, which you do, you're going to suffer and you're going to die. It's not going to go well with you. So look at beginning at verse 13. If you say, we will not dwell in the land, disobeying the voice of the Lord your God. If you say, no, we're not, we're not staying. We're going to go. We've got our minds made up. We're going to go. And saying, we want to go. Now, th this was a key I talked about a moment ago. We're going to go to the land of Egypt where there'll be no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor will be hungry with bread, and we'll dwell there. It's going to be far better in Egypt because there's a famine in this land, and, and we're hungry, and... Uh, because of what's going on in Jerusalem, if we're going to, we want to go into uh, to Egypt and we won't have war. We'll get away from the war. We'll get away from the sound of the trumpet, the sounding of the war uh, battles, and, and we're going to have food. It's going to be far better when we get over to Egypt. If that's what you say, and you have wholly set your face, look at verse 15, to enter Egypt, then here's what you're going to face. You might underline this at verse 16. You're going to face the sword. And you're going to face a famine. And verse, in the verse uh, 16, you'll die. And in verse 17, if you set your face to go to Egypt, there's going to be a pestilence. You might underline all of that. Pestilence, dying, famine, and a sword. Now let's stop and footnote and make a practical lesson here. There are times when we're seeking to avoid a problem, we run directly into the very problem we're seeking to avoid. You see, they want to avoid war. They want to avoid pestilence. They want to avoid famine. So they, they're going to run to Egypt. He said, you run to Egypt, you're going to run into war, and you're going to run into pestilence, you're going to run into famine, and you're going to run into death. The very thing you're seeking to avoid is what you're going to get. How does that work with us? Well, sometimes we're, we're, we're so afraid of losing our children, we don't want to turn their back on it, so we cater to them and give them everything they want. And we spoil them, and we're running right in the direction of the very thing we feared. We're afraid we're going to run people away, and we're going to run people off, and we're, they, we may lose them uh, to the world if, if, we, if we teach them the truth. So we soft-pedal things, and because of that, they run in the direction where we were fearful they were going to go to start with. I've known of husbands who catered to everything their wives wanted because they were fearful they're going to run from them and, and have an affair. And when they did that, they spoiled them and they ended up having the affair and they went the other direction. The very thing they were trying to avoid is the very thing they ran toward. And on and on, problems in the church. We want to avoid problems in the church. So let's not deal with this because we don't want division. So we let things go until there's problems in the church. The very thing we were trying to avoid. We ran right smack into it. Well, that's what they're doing here. Now let's go to verse, six, uh, verse 18. They said, for thus says the Lord of hosts, as my anger and my fury has been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my anger will be poured out on you in Egypt. He said, did you not understand when the people rebelled against God, that's when I brought uh, vengeance on, on Jerusalem? And when you disobey me, the same thing's going to happen to you when you get to Egypt. And then he adds another thing. Now remember, we've already underlined sword, famine, pestilence, and you're going to die but at the end of verse 18, he said, it shall be, you shall be an oath and an astonishment, a curse and a reproach, and you shall see this place no more. You're going to suffer verbal abuse and intimidation on top of everything else. As if that's not enough, you're going to face this verbal abuse and insults. So emphatically, God said at verse 19, do not go to Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. Get, you want you to understand what I told you. Do not go to Egypt. How much plainer can God be? Now look at verse 20. Might circle, underline some things at verse 20. For you were hypocrites. I'm reading from the New King James. Yours will read different and I'll tell you why. Uh, in just a moment. But you were hypocrites in your heart when you sent me to God, the Lord your God, saying, pray to the Lord for us. In other words, um, let me talk about the alternate translations of that. It may say, the footnote, by the way, will say to that, use deceit against yourselves. Uh, your translation will, in essence, say this probably, if it doesn't say you were hypocrites, that you deceived no one but yourself. That's what he's saying. In other words, you came to me saying, go to God and ask God what he wants us to do. 
If anybody was deceived by that, it was you, and you were the only ones that were deceived by that because I saw through that, and I knew. I knew. You didn't want to hear what God said. Evidence. They've never been interested in what God said before. They've never been interested before in what God said. So you deceived yourself. You were acting as hypocrites when you came to me asking me what, what, what I wanted to, uh, what, uh, what God wanted. Now let's drop down to verse 22 and we'll finish this chapter and then move on. Know that for certain that you shall die by the sword and the famine and the pestilence uh, in the place that, where you uh, desire to go sojourn. You see, what they were really wanting, if I, if I learn anything from 42, I learned this. What they seem to really be wanting in light of verse 20, verse 20 is the key to me understanding this. What they really seem to want is to ask God to bless them in what they've already decided to do. I want to say that again. I want you to get that point. It seemed what they really wanted. Go to God and talk to God for us. And they wanted God to give his stamp of approval to what they had already decided to do. You say, I can't believe that. I won't tell you, every preacher's had this happen where somebody calls them and asks them a Bible question and what they're wanting is, I've already decided to do this and I want you to tell me that's okay. And when you say, well, that's not what the Bible says, they hang up and they're, they're talking to somebody else. All right, here's my marriage situation and do I have a right to remarry? Well, no, the Bible teaches, well, then they're done with you. I want to know what the Bible says. No, you don't want to know what the Bible says. What you're wanting is God's stamp of approval on what you've already decided you want to do. That's what Jeremiah is saying to them. Well, we're no different in our own day and time, I suppose. So that's chapter 42. He seeks the Lord's advice for them, but they're not interested in that. And chapter 43 is evidence of that. Now, chapter 43, God's word is rejected and the remnant moves to Egypt. They do the very thing they said they wouldn't do. We're going to do whatever God says, whether it's, whether it's pleasing or displeasing. Whether we like it or not, we're going to do what God says. So let's look at verses 1 to 7, the flight of the people to Egypt. They start off with and charging uh, Jeremiah and Baruch uh, falsely. And you're looking for that in your handout. What was the charge against each of them? Well, let's see. When they came to Jeremiah, when he stopped speaking these words, they came to him. Notice at verse 2, the proud men spoke. You might underline the word proud. We'll make a point about that here in a second. And they say, you speak falsely. The Lord our God has not sent you. To say, do not go and sojourn in Egypt. I'll tell you what I'm learning from that is, is we reject the message quite often when it's not the message we wanted to hear. We go hear a message preached and it wasn't what I wanted to hear. That, that's not what I like. It's not what fits what I want to do. And so you reject the message. And so what's the charge? He's not telling the truth about that. Um. Abundant evidence that Jeremiah was a prophet. Look at the, the, the miraculous things that have taken place er, er, earlier in the book that give evidence indeed he's telling the truth. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, I, I'm learning something here about how one sin leads to another. Their pride, that's why I had you to underline that, led to their rejection of the word. The rejection of the word led to their disobedience. We're going to see that in a moment. They're going to Egypt anyway. And that leads, all of that leads to them falsely making false charges and accusations against the man who told them the truth. That happens time and time again. Uh, people, their pride leads them to reject the message. The rejecting of the message leads them to commit sin. And when somebody tells them they're wrong, they bring false accusations against the person who tells them they're wrong. Nothing new. This has happened over and over and over again. Now, that was the charge against Jeremiah. You're not speaking by God. You speak falsely. The charge against Baruch was he's the ringleader. Look at verse 6. Verse 3, right? That he's, he, he has set you against us. You see, what he's trying to do is drive us into the hands of the Babylonians. He wants to see us destroyed. He's behind this. He's putting you up to this. And you're speaking falsely. Now, beginning at verse 4, having made their fault. By, by the way, let me footnote here. I don't know that this was the cause, but I want to tell you what this accomplishes. If you can make a false charge against somebody who's telling you you're wrong, that makes you feel better. You say, how so? Let's suppose you, 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 you start into to some sin, and, and let's say the elders come and they talk to you about your being in sin, and you are in sin, and here's the passage. If you could bring a, even a false charge 
that the elders are liars and that they are deceivers and they're false teachers, to say the least, it makes you feel better about yourself. That, you know, I'm not listening to a bunch of false teachers like you are and to hypocrites like you fellows are, and uh, that makes you feel better about yourself. And perhaps it did them too. I don't, the text doesn't say that here, but that often happens to be the case. The beginning at verse 4. So Johanan and all the captains of the forces and all the people would not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land. So what did they do? They took off and went to Egypt. I want you to pay close attention to verse 6. That the men and the women and the children, the king's daughters, etc. And uh, notice at the end of the verse. You might underline, and Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch, the son of Neriah. So they went to the land of Egypt. Make a marginal note somewhere. Chapter 43, verse 6, apparently Jeremiah and Baruch are taken by force. Because Jeremiah ends up in, in Egypt. That's where he goes. And I have a hard time imagining a man preaching against God said, don't go, don't go, don't go. And then he says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go with you, though, if you're going. I have a hard time without God rebuking him for that. There is no rebuke here at all to Jeremiah. But chapter 43, verse 6 seems to indicate that he was taken by force. And they have taken him captive prior to this, you remember. Uh, But anyway, they take him by force and they take him off. Uh, So they go to Egypt. The very thing they said they wouldn't do. Now then, let's get 8 to 13. See if we can finish this chapter and then get to the other two. So what happens in 8 to 13? Jeremiah um, tells them that the king of Babylon is going to conquest Egypt. They've already been told this. But when you're going to Egypt, you think you're going there for safety and you're getting away from all the problems. But I'm going to tell you, you're going for more problems. You, you haven't, you're not getting out, out, of, out of trouble. And they're learning a very bitter lesson to learn. You cannot escape from God. You can't escape from God. You can't run from God. You can't go somewhere else and get away from the punishment of God. Uh, you just can't run from God. Um, so let's start now at verse 8. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in Topanes. Toponese. So where is that? Well, let's stop for a moment and identify where they are. They, they went on their way to Egypt. Um, and right here within that uh, uh, red circle there, or oval, is where Toponese is. Now, to get your bearing, if you're not following here, here is the Palestine. I'm, my arrow is right there at the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea. And then here's the Sinai Peninsula. And right here is the, uh, at the northern part of Egypt. So that's where they've made it. And Jeremiah is with them. And the word of the Lord comes to him there, the text says. So let's get back to our outline here and uh, let's see what uh, he says about that. Beginning at verse 8, the Lord said to him, Take large stones and hide them in the sight of the men of Judah in the clay brick courtyard at the entrance of Pharaoh's house. And so in other words, he he was to take some stones and embed them in the mortar of the the pavement or the stones. Perhaps it was uh, stones embedded in sand and embedded it in the mortar in the sand. I'm not sure exactly what was done. But this was a symbolic act. You're looking for this, by the way, on your handout. It's a symbolic act. I want everybody to see that I'm embedding these stones here and putting them down here under this uh, pavement or under this uh, entrance. And you're going to say to them that I will send Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and he'll set his throne on top of this. In other words, this was to be a symbolic thing. I want you to know that right here, he's, that, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and he's going to set up his throne right here. In other words, he's going to be, take over Egypt and, and rule over Egypt. And when he comes, verse 11, those appointed for death, he will give death, and those who appointed to captivity will give captivity. And I'm going to kindle a fire in the house of the gods of Egypt. So all their gods are going to be destroyed. Now this is an interesting picture. You might underline it, verse 12, that he shall array himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd puts on a garment, and he goes from, uh, uh, and he shall go out from there in peace. In other words, king of Babylon's coming in, he's going to take Egypt under his control, and he's going to wear Egypt like a garment. Now that's a pretty powerful picture. 
as a shepherd puts on his garment to go out into the, to the fields, and uh, uh, he's going to put on Egypt as one of his garments. In other words, he's going to take Egypt under his control, is, is the point that he makes. Now then, at verse 13, to finish that chapter, and he shall break the sacred pillars of Beth Shemesh that are in the land of Egypt, the houses of their gods. Well, did that happen? Well, it, it obviously did. Uh, about five years from this point of this prophecy, about five years later, which would bring us to about 582, 581 B.C., uh, the king of Babylon killed the king of uh, the Egyptian king, and took Jews from Egypt to Babylon. Some years after that, about 568 B.C., he invaded them again. And so scholars will talk about which one of those was the fulfillment of it. doesn't matter. It was fulfilled. All that God said, in fact, he didn't date when it's going to happen, that the king of Babylon is coming. He's going to destroy Egypt and put it under his control. And he invaded it twice, killed the king, took the Jews to uh, captivity into Babylon, and so was the prophecy fulfilled. His, history, Josephus says, it was fulfilled, and the prophecy came true. Big surprise, big surprise. All right, let's go to chapter 44 now. This is Jeremiah's final warning against idolatry to the Jews in Egypt. Now, they're off in Egypt, and that's where Jeremiah's with them. Again, he's taken by force. So we see three things. The warning is presented, and then they renounce God and pledge loyalty to the Queen of Heaven. Now, that's interesting. And then the Lord renounces them and he promises punishment. And uh, when we get through with that chapter, we're nearly done because we've, uh, with tonight's lesson anyway, we only have five, was it five verses in chapter 45. So let's work our way through 44 now. Work our way through 44. Uh, this is Jeremiah's final warning. This very well may be the final message that he gives to the remnant. Now, is there more to the book? Well, there's the, the nation section, which is not necessarily sequential, like after this prophecy, now he starts prophesying against the nations. Uh, it's the arrangement of the book. So he has the nation section, then he has a summary at the end, in chapter 52, we'll get to a little bit later. But this very well may be the last message to the remnant. Be that as it may. Here's the warning, and that is, I want you to think about what has happened. They, they've forgotten their history. So here's what he says. Look at verse, thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm reading at verse 2. Uh, oh, by the way, the, uh, the, without reading all the names uh, from Migdal to Pathros, uh, Jews from the northern end of Egypt, they're scattered throughout Egypt at this point, from the northern end to the southern part, in other words, from all parts of Egypt have gathered together, and he gives them this message. And so thus says the Lord, you have seen the calamity that I brought on Jerusalem and all the cities of Judah, and behold, this day there are desolation, and no one dwells in them. Have you forgotten, he tells these Jews, what happened to Jerusalem? Do you not remember that, that Jerusalem was destroyed? And look back at Jerusalem and there's, there's basically nothing there anymore. The temple is destroyed, the city's been burned, the walls laying down flat, the city's destroyed. Why was that? Look at verse 3. Because of their wickedness that they committed and they provoked me to anger to burn incense to serve other gods. That's what happened. You know that. You know your history. Look at verse 4. However, I have sent to you, I warned you about this. You heard the same warnings. This is something we've seen multiple times. I sent prophets to you rising up early and sending them. That idea of rising up early uh, was I sent them with urgency of the message. Uh, I sent prophets to you rising up early. Um, well, let's see, I've lost my place. That's verse, uh, where was it? Verse 4. Uh, Sending them saying, oh, do not do the abominable thing that I hate. But look at verse 5. But they didn't listen or incline their ear. In other words, that's why Jerusalem fell. Have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten what happened to Jerusalem? So my fury and my anger, here's the result, was kindled against them and they are wasted and desolate to this day. There's two things accomplished by what he just said. Is, is he, uh, he reminds them of their history. I think you've forgotten your history of what happened to Jerusalem and why. And you're going in the same direction and you think you're going to be any different? But a second thing that's accomplished in that is, by the way, by the way, my prophecy came true. I had been saying they were going to be destroyed and they were destroyed. And I'm telling you, when you go to Egypt, you're going to face punishment and it'll happen to you just like it happened to them. By the way, my prophecy came true. 
Now let's begin at verse 7. Notice his question of why. You're looking for this in your handout, by the way. Why do you commit this great evil against me to cut off woman and child and infant and leaving none to remain? He seems to make an emotional appeal to them. Not, I don't think he's playing on emotionalism, but think of this, what you're doing. You're not just committing sin, but the sin is causing you to cut off every man, woman, and child and infant, and nobody's going to remain because you've determined you're going to do whatever you want to do, that you might provoke me to wrath uh, when you go to the land of Egypt and, and follow after the uh, sin. Now, look at verse 9. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers? And the wickedness of their wives and the wickedness of your wives that they committed. Have you forgotten all of that? Look at verse 10 to finish that section. They had not been humbled. They had not been humbled to this day, nor have they feared that they have not walked in my law and my statutes. Here's the real problem. When people are humbled and they fear God, they'll walk in his statutes. And the people that are going to Egypt and have gone to Egypt and determined to go to Egypt, they have not been humbled, nor do they fear God either one. You might underline the word humbled and the word feared at verse 10. Now let's begin at verse 11. Verse 11, God said, I've set my face against you and none of you are going to escape. Um, we don't have time to read all the verses, but um, again, notice at verse, verse 12, he mentions the sword and the famine. Verse 13, I will punish you. You'll become a, a curse, by the way. We saw that earlier, verse 12. Verse 13, I will punish those who dwell in the land of Egypt as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword and the famine and the pestilence. And none of the remnant which have gone to the land of Egypt shall escape or survive. And then he says at the end, for none shall return except those who escape. Sound like a contradiction. I'm not, uh, I don't think that's a contradiction. I think what he's saying, that as a whole, that I'm going, to, I'm going to punish the nation. Would there be some to escape? Sure. Because he says so at the end of verse. But as a whole, he's going to punish, punish them who go into Egypt. Now, beginning at verse 15 now, the second section here. They renounced the Lord and they pledged loyalty to the queen of Egypt. Even after all of that. You know, notice his warning. That was his final warning. You didn't learn your lesson from Jerusalem and Judah. And you're doing the very same thing, and you're going to be punished just like they, they were punished. They don't listen. Here's what they say. You might underline it. Verse 16. Um, they said, in essence, uh, we will not listen to you. That's the first thing they said. Secondly, we're going to basically do, and I'm going to paraphrase verse 17, we're going to do what we've done before. We're just going to keep doing that. We have to appreciate the honesty of that. Um, I better appreciate that, let me footnote, than someone who says they're going to change and then they don't change. Uh, I can appreciate the honesty of the person who says, well, you know, um, you told me I've sinned and I've done wrong, and, but I'm going to keep doing what I've always done. That's what they say. All right, look at, verse, at the end of verse 17. They said... Um, yeah, verse 17, for, I'm at the end of verse 17, for then we had plenty of food. In other words, when we were worshiping the idols, when we bowed before the idols, I'm at the end of verse 17, for then we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no trouble. We fared quite well when we were in sin. We fared well when we were over there serving uh, before the fall of Jerusalem. We fared quite well. We had food at least. But since we stopped burning incense, uh, we've, we've lacked everything. And so now that's when problems started. And the women also said, verse 19, that uh, when we burnt incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings, did we not do that and uh, we, we did not do that without our husband's permission? In other words, our husbands gave permission to that. So we didn't do anything wrong. Now, who is the and who and what is the queen of the heavens? It's probably a god of fertility, is thought to be. Uh, and so everything was going well when we were serving these gods and uh, these idols. And we fared well when we served the queen of heaven, they said. And that gets us down to verse 19. Now, beginning at verse 20, 
through verse 30 is point, the Lord renounces them. So let's get this quickly because uh, our time is running out. Uh, look at verse 21. The incense that you burned in the cities and in the streets of Jerusalem, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, verse 22, when the Lord could no longer bear it because of the abomination. Uh, in other words, he brought this calamity upon you. Look at verse 23. For this, therefore, this calamity has happened to you as it is this day. It was the idolatry that you bowed to. The very thing you're talking about you did when you fared well, that's what brought that problem on you and that destruction. Now then, beginning at verse 24, basically Jeremiah's message is it's over. Let me tell you, it's over now. You can talk about how well it was, but you've gone, verse 24 and 25, you've gone to the gods. Look at that. Uh, you will surely, I'm mean, at the end of verse 25, you will surely fulfill your vows and perform your vows. You've gone to your gods, you made vows to your gods, you're going you're to serve your gods. I know you're going to do that. Um, and look at verse 26. God is saying, you've rejected me. My name shall no longer be named in the mouth of any man in Judah, uh, uh, in all the land of Egypt, says the Lord. I don't think he's saying that no one will ever mention God again, but I think that's a rejection of God. They're not going to have use for God anymore. They've already said they don't have use for God. And so you've rejected God. So verses 27, 28, 29, and 30, to finish that chapter, what's he basically saying? You're going to perish in Egypt. Look at the end of verse 27. You shall be consumed by the, by the sword and the famine until there is an end to them. And the rest of the chapter basically saying that you are going to be punished and you're going to come to an end in Egypt. The very thing you feared is what's going to happen to you. And he's done. Because chapter 45 is another matter. And that's basically the last message of Jeremiah. You think about all the years of preaching that Jeremiah has done. And that's the last sermon that he basically preaches. Quite a sad story. All right. Uh, let's go to chapter 45 to finish up. And uh, this is only five verses. Uh, Baruch is, is, um, is comforted. Uh, he is discouraged, verses 1 to 3. Verse 3, sa he was saying things like, Woe is me, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. And I fainted in um, my sighings, and I find no rest. By the way, uh, you're looking in your outline or your uh, handout for the dating of this. Not a specific date, but it was in the... Uh, well, it is a specific date, but I don't have it written here. Um, but it's in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. So we're backing up a little bit. Zedekiah was the last king. And this was Josiah, then Jehoiakim, then Jehoiakim, and uh, then Zedekiah. So um, we're backing up a little bit. This is when that discouragement came earlier, not right here at the last siege. Uh, be that as it may, beginning now at verse 4 and 5, here's what God says in three points to him by way of encouraging him, and we'll stop. And the basic three points is, verse 4, that behold, what I have built I will break down, and what I planted I will pluck up, that is this whole land. Um, and, and so are we talking about Egypt? No, we're, we're backing up before they go off to Egypt, so this is the land of Judah. Um, and so the point is, God is a sovereign ruler, so wait on the Lord. I, I, I made this land. I'll deal with this land. I made this nation. I'll deal with this nation. I rule in this nation. I rule over this land. I rule over all the nations. I'm the sovereign ruler. And so you're discouraged, Baruch. I understand that. But just wait on the Lord because I'm in control. Tell you what, that's not bad advice for any of us. You, you ever get discouraged with what's going on in society? Why does God let this go on? And, and all the the uh, terrible sins that are going on in one nation doing this, and, and it looks like the U.S. is going down the tubes uh, with its morality. God says, I'm in control. Just, just hang on, hang on. Let me handle this. And he'll handle it in his way. Secondly, verse 5, don't seek great things for yourself. If you seek great things for yourself, don't do that. Um, I forgot who it was, whether, I believe it was Harkwriter who made the observation that he thinks that means um, don't seek great things for yourself, but put God first. I'll take that. And then verse 5, the last part, that I will bring adversity on all, God says, but I'm going to give you life. That's, that's the assurance he gives to Baruch. Yeah, things are not going to be easy. They're not going to be good. And yes, this this... So we backed up a little bit. So at this point, 
Jerusalem hadn't fallen yet. Yeah, it's coming. There's going to be another siege and another siege, and consequently it's going to fall. And when it does, I'll say to you, though, you'll be saved. And maybe the fulfillment of that was that he was taken by force to Egypt, which he was. And we'll stop on that note.